Hello, welcome to the Anti-Spyware Coalition panel. Um, thanks everyone for coming. We uh, are going to get started now because uh, we are one panelist short, you'll note, from uh, the uh, original book here. Uh, Jerry Dixon from uh, DHS uh, isn't here and he's not going to be at the Meet the Feds panel either, so uh, unfortunately. But uh, um, we do have still have a great panel and uh, uh, I'm going to start off uh, my name is Ari Schwartz. I'm the uh, Deputy Director of the Center for Democracy and Technology, and we run the Anti-Spyware Coalition. Um, uh, I'm just I'm moderating the panel, so I'm just going to briefly go over who the Anti-Spyware Coalition is, and then we can talk about some of the issues uh, that we've seen uh, uh, recently. Um, the Anti-Spyware Coalition was uh, really came out of um, a, a previous failed attempt to create something similar, something called the Coalition of Anti-Spyware Technologies. And, and uh, for those of you that missed the stories on, on how that, what happened there, uh, I think it will give you a good idea of, of what uh, the, um, the Anti-Spyware Coalition's mission is. Uh, COAST, the, the previous group, um, had uh, set up a pro program to uh, try and certify um, spyware technologies. So what they would do is they would have the anti-spyware companies got together, they would come up with a set of uh, objective criteria um, for what uh, what is spyware and what's not spyware and then companies could get certified that they were not spyware was the idea. Um, and it ended up getting uh, subverted by some of the spyware companies, some of the, particularly the adware companies, joining the coalition of anti-spyware technologies, and uh, then trying to change the uh, criteria in their favor, and uh, it uh, really fell apart quickly. Uh, and after that, all the anti-spyware companies left, uh, and a few of them came to us at the Center for Democracy and Technology and said, "How would you guys run this so that it would be different and that you could avoid that kind of capture?" And we uh, we. Uh, came up, we, we run a lot of working groups in a similar style. We, we went over what that style is, which is we work with a set of companies, uh, we bring the companies in, and we also have public interest groups in the room as well. Um, so we, we try to bring in really a broad set of uh, public interest groups into, into the room as well, uh, and academic researchers as well, so, uh, and some of the uh, legal aid clinics that work on uh, technology issues. Um, so we have all the anti-spyware, uh, major anti-spyware companies involved um, and many of their distributors. And then we also have the uh, National Center for Victims of Crime and the National Network to End Domestic Violence, groups that work on these, on stalking issues um, and s s saw the importance of uh, getting involved in this kind of an issue, uh, and, as well as uh, the, the Samuelson Clinic at Berkeley and others. Um, so that get, just to give you a sense of, uh, the, the, of how we came about. And when we formed, we really, we just, we, the original goal was to create a set of objective criteria the way that, that Coast had, but in an unbiased uh, uh, way. Um, and uh, really, w w in starting that process, we realized quickly that we were having uh, discussions using similar terms that meant different things. So we felt that that meant that we needed to have a set of definitions to put out there. So really, we put out the set of definitions. Uh, we had a public comment process on this. Uh, we got. Uh, over 400 comments, including the government of Luxembourg, gave us a full, de very detailed set of comments. Um, you know, as well as many of the companies involved, and some of the spyware companies gave us comments too. We brought those back, tried to figure out which ones we thought were legitimate, and, and redid that process. Uh, and that document is continually updated, and it's continually being updated. We've already had one update of it, and we're probably going to do another soon. Um, in that, pro through that process of putting together the definitions, we also helped to, to uh, help provide ways for people to educate others um, and um, to stop and, and one of the main goals of, of the group was to help cut down on uh, the ability of spyware companies to sue anti-spyware companies uh, based on uh, the fact that there was no criteria out there. Um, and that information is up on our website, the antispywarecoalition.org website. So here's a list of all the members. Uh, you probably cannot read it from there. but. Um, uh, just to give you a sense, uh, I mean, pretty much all of the major anti-spyware companies and their distributors, uh, as I, I read some of the other, uh, some of these other uh, smaller groups out as well. Bit9 is a member, uh, sitting, and Mario sitting next to me, and so is, there are a couple other members in the audience here that I see, so um, uh, if you want to have questions about membership or who's a member, you can come up to me afterwards, and I, uh, or to the Q&A, we can go over it. Um, 
since doing that definitions document, we've also done a vendor dispute process. So if you have some software that gets flagged as, as spyware, uh, what steps do you go through with an anti-spyware company? Uh, what, are, what are the industry standard best practices on what, what steps you should go through? Um, the, the risk model document, which is that objective criteria document, uh, which uh, rates both uh, threats and uh, uh, positive, the, the positive criteria. Um, tips for consumers. Um, as I was saying before, educational documents. Best practices, which is really one of the hardest documents to write, which is sort of an aspirational set of criteria to try and get at what, um, uh, what companies that are in the spyware definition should be doing and what direction should they be heading without being so concrete the way that the risk model is. Um, and then the conflict resolution document, which is for anti-spyware companies that run into conflicts between each other, how do they go about trying to resolve those? We've had some public workshops. We just had one in Harvard last month. Um, and uh, uh, we, we will continue to have, we'll probably have one next year uh, as well, probably uh, maybe in Washington again. Um, in the next steps that we're really taking are working on information sharing. We've been in a dialogue with the anti-phishing working group and some other working groups that are uh, trying to do similar sharing. Uh, and we're trying to uh, work together on uh, standards and, and means to do that. And lastly, uh, uh, testing criteria, which is probably the most active area right now. Uh, the way that spyware tests have been done in the past, uh, anti-spyware tests have been done in the past that, that uh, you see both for uh, certification purposes and in, in publications, uh, they all have very different uh, methodologies. And what we're trying to do is not to standardize the methodology, but instead to have a way of describing those methodologies so that people can do a real comparison. So if you want an anti-spyware software, you know, you can see the test, know what they're testing for, compare that to another test where, where one, one anti-spyware software might be ranked fifth in, that one, in one of them and first in the other one. You can see from the methodologies why that might be and what might be important for you. Uh, and that's the goal. Um, and so with that, I'm going to uh, pass it on to the panelists and, and talk about these issues. Um, I don't know if the, there are bios in this packet, but uh, the first, uh, here's my contact information as well. Uh, the first panelist is uh, Eileen Harrington, who's the Deputy Director of the Federal Trade Commission, has been there for 23 years, and is uh, one of the best people in Washington, to, law, law enforcement people in Washington to work with. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, she's going to talk a little bit about what the FTC has done in the spyware space and what they plan to do. Thanks, Harry. Um, well, I think you're one of the best people, too. Um, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I'm with the Federal Trade Commission. And uh, our agency has a very broad statutory mandate to protect consumers in the marketplace by enforcing the FTC Act's prohibitions against deceptive and unfair practices. We enforce over 30 other specific consumer protection laws as well. But in terms of spyware and law enforcement targeting spyware, we've used our statutory authority to uh, challenge practices that are deceptive and unfair. And those terms have both, I'm sure, common sense meaning to you and a very uh, well-developed meaning in the law. The FTC not only enforces laws, uh, but we also have regulatory authority. For example, we issued the rules that created the National Do Not Call Registry um, and enforce federal telemarketing rules. How many of you are on the National Do Not Call Registry? Excellent. Uh, that's probably the, the most well-known thing that we've ever done. Um, we um, are also uh, responsible for enforcing antitrust laws um, along with the Department of Justice. So you may have read, for example, that the FTC is reviewing the double click, uh, the Google double click merger. That's our antitrust side that's doing that. We keep the marketplace safe for consumers by acting to stop deceptive and unfair practices and by making sure that consumers have robust choices in the marketplace. We do that by enforcing antitrust laws. We're a small agency. We're a civil enforcement agency. That means we don't put people in jail. We can't get criminal fines. We go to court. We get orders to stop behavior and uh, orders that require companies to give up their ill-gotten profits or give consumers their money back if consumers have been defrauded. In spyware, um, our law enforcement work has been based on three important principles. First, the computer belongs to the consumer and not to the software distributor. Second, 
buried disclosures of material information don't work in the online world any more than they worked in the offline world to satisfy the legal requirement that material information be disclosed to consumers prior to um, either transactions obligating them or other things happening. In this case, their computer being taken over. Um, so you can't bury disclosures in a EULA or in some other inconspicuous way concerning uh, software that's been downloaded onto the computer. And third, if a distributor puts a program on a consumer's computer, uh, the consumer has to be able to remove that program easily or disable it. Uh, now, the FTC, in addition to doing law enforcement work um, targeting some spyware distributors, uh, has been working to raise consumer awareness. We do a lot of work in the consumer education area. In fact, um, we think that the best way to protect consumers is to make sure that they're well informed in the first instance. We have a very good website, On Guard Online, uh, it's at onguardonline.gov. It has an array of information for consumers about how to stay safe in the online environment. And uh, wonderful little games and quizzes and informative pieces. Uh, I urge you to go there. There's a lot of information there about spyware and how consumers can protect themselves and their computers from uh, unauthorized downloads in the first place or infections. We've also been working to raise industry awareness, uh, and particularly in the advertising industry. Um, we have contacted directly scores and hundreds now of advertisers who, um, uh, whose content has been uh, distributed through software downloads, warning them about uh, the, the need uh, to pay attention to how their ads are distributed and to also their possible liability to an FTC lawsuit um, if their advertisements are distributed in a way that causes injury or is likely to cause injury to consumers and uh, they know or should know uh, that that's the case. Um, so we have been working uh, hard with the advertising industry to get them to pay attention and cut off the flow of money to um, illegitimate software distributors. We also support technological solutions in the first instance. Uh, these are technology problems and probably uh, the most useful steps that can be taken uh, will be in the technology arena. On the enforcement side, as I mentioned, we've brought cases. We've brought 11 of them against uh, software distributors of spyware and malware. The most recent matters, uh, Zango Inc., which Ben, I think, is going to talk about, um, and Direct Revenue, address each of them, the three principles that I mentioned previously as being at the core of our spyware enforcement work. The orders require that the respondents, that the defendants in these cases, give clear and prominent disclosures and obtain consumers' express consent before they download software onto the consumer's computers. And the orders also require that the respondents identify their ads and establish, implement, and maintain user-friendly mechanisms that consumers can use to complain about ads, uh, stop pop-ups, and uninstall their adware. Now, we think that most of the worst of spyware, and this is increasingly the case, is criminal in nature. And as I mentioned, we're a civil enforcement agency, not a criminal enforcement agency. The differences between those two are these. Um, First of all, the remedies that criminal enforcement agencies are able to obtain are different than the remedies that civil enforcement agencies can obtain. We can get orders to stop and orders to return money or disgorge money. Criminal enforcers can put people in jail. They can put people on probation. They can impose criminal fines. The other difference is that the, stand, the burden of proof that has to be met is different. In a civil case, we have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that we've that, that a deceptive or unfair practice has occurred. In a criminal case, uh, the prosecutors have to show that whatever statute it is that they're enforcing was violated beyond a reasonable doubt. So it's a slightly higher evidentiary standard. Um, but we think that much of what we're seeing now in the spyware area is criminal in nature. And so we work very, very closely with our colleagues at the Department of Justice, both in the computer crime section in Washington and at United States Attorney's offices around the country. For example, in one of our recent cases that we filed civilly, FTC versus ERG Ventures, 
Uh, we alleged that the defendants secretly downloaded spyware and other malevolent software programs onto millions of consumers' computers without getting their consent. At the very same time that we filed our case in federal court, the United States Attorney's Office uh, in the District of Columbia uh, executed um, criminal search warrants in connection with their criminal investigation of the same targets. That kind of cooperative work happens quite frequently between the FTC and the con computer crimes people at DOJ. A number of the people who work, the lawyers who work in that section, used to work for me at the FTC. We have kind of a nice back and forth. Um, and uh, so uh, th that kind of cooperation uh, is important, and we think it's increasingly important as we see spyware and spam uh, actually kind of coming together uh, to uh, serve as vehicles for malevolent software and code winding up on people's computers uh, in ways that are criminal. We see gangs outside of the United States increasingly responsible or involved in these kinds of attacks on people's computers in the United States. Uh, we have some very useful new statutory authority at the FTC, the U.S. Safe Web Act, and um, we are using that authority uh, to provide information to foreign governments uh, in aid of their investigations into these kinds of criminal acts. And we're also um, able now under this statute to receive information from our foreign counterparts. P prior to the enactment of this statute, uh, there were some obstacles to the Federal Trade Commission's exchange of this kind of sensitive information with our foreign counterparts. Um, this law was enacted last uh, November, and we are very happy to be able to use it. Um, what we see in the near future for spyware, uh, increased um, criminal criminalization, really, of these activities. Um, hopefully increased responsibility on the part of uh, domestic ad companies that advertise online so that they are far more careful about paying attention to how their ad content gets distributed. Uh, more cooperation between civil and criminal authorities in the United States and also between U.S. authorities and authorities around the world. Um, I think that's it for now, um, Ari. We'll be happy to take questions. Okay. Um, next is uh, Ben Edelman, who is probably well known to a lot of people in this room. He is the best known, uh, uh, deservedly so, the best known uh, spyware researcher. Uh, and also now can add a uh, professor at Harvard Business School to that uh, title as well. Thanks, Ari. Uh, I want to see if I can use this big screen for something here today, namely to show the kinds of unfair and deceptive installations that have kept Eileen busy filing 11 lawsuits. Uh, here's one that I remember from some two years ago, and despite being two years old, it, it really was a useful pair of examples to me, both in showing things getting worse rather than better over time, and in putting pressure on the notion of consent. So we've all seen these screens. This is the standard ActiveX screen shown by uh, Windows XP, i.e. up through Service Pack 2. Um, in Service Pack 1 and previously, it looked like this. There would be a yes button that got truncated. And if you press the yes button, then the software would install. So to Claria Gator Gaines' credit, this software actually wouldn't install unless you press the yes button. So we can't say that the software installed without consent in any substantial quantity. And yet, when you look at the disclosures, which I've boxed in those red rectangles, you see that they are not giving consumers the information that consumers would need in order to make an informed decision. To be told that this software will show you gain-branded ads, you know, you might think those ads are going to appear maybe in the aquarium that is purportedly the reason why you'd install this software. It's a screensaver aquarium. Put an ad for Coca-Cola in the screensaver. Sure, that would be one thing. But no, actually what Gator Claria Gain was doing was quite different. It was near full screen pop-ups. You'd go to Gateway and get an ad for Dell, go to Dell and get an ad for Gateway. Well, they sure don't tell you anything like that, do they? Um, and that leads us right into the FTC's recent settlement with Zango, where the FTC sets out this remarkably tight, carefully drafted set of requirements for what Zango has to do before installing. And a block of text is a little bit dense, especially on screen, but just to highlight the key points, Zango needs express consent. They must clearly and prominently disclose the material terms of their software. They must do that 
prior to and separate from any EULA. You can't put the material terms in paragraph 37 of a 90-page EULA. No, no, you have to show these prominently and clearly and prior to any EULA that you might display. So that's a great settlement. It says exactly what Zango needs to do. Uh, but what about the next question? Do they actually do it? Uh, does Eileen get to go and sue them again? Well, maybe she does. And here's the set of screenshots that would at least make you think she might have to. Uh, I was at this lovely radio storm site, which has some kind of streaming music, and got the pop-up shown right in the center, media.fastclick.net. So that's a pop-up from FastClick, part of the value click uh, ad conglomerate, a large publicly traded ad network. And it says, do you want to block junk emails? Well, wouldn't we all like to block junk emails? So a reasonable user might click anywhere on that ad, not just on the yes button. Anywhere you click, you get taken to this landing page, which tells you a little bit about what the software will purportedly do, like protect your inbox from annoying junk email. But it sure doesn't say anything about any pop-up ads, any tracking of what searches you do at search engines, or what websites you visit, what products you buy, and what have you. It doesn't say they're going to do that, although it turns out they are going to do that. So this prominent disclosure of material terms, well, it hasn't happened yet. Maybe in the next screen. We'll see. I press the free download button. I get the standard IESP2 security warning, another security warning, but you just press the run button just as you'd have to do to install any other EXE you're downloading. And now I get a EULA. You see right on the top line, Terms of Use and End User License Agreement. It doesn't say anything too interesting or too substantive in its first screen. We believe users should be able to choose to receive free software in exchange for limited reasonable advertising. Okay, but that's not the material terms that are at issue. The material terms would be, we'll show you pop-up advertising. We'll track what websites you visit. They haven't put those terms in here. They haven't done what the settlement requires. What if you press the I accept button? Then you get this screen, which surely is the most interesting of all of them. Notice that there is no cancel button. There's no reject button. There's no refuse button. By the time you're in here, you can't even press an X in the upper right-hand corner because, as you'll see, well, there is no X in the upper right-hand corner. There's just a blank space where the X belongs. Meanwhile, what they're describing here is actually quite different from what you would have thought you were signing up for. You signed up to stop spam, and now they're telling you you need to choose between a free ad-supported version or a paid version with no price listed. So if you're a consumer confronting this screen, you're certainly not likely to want to choose the paid version without knowing how much you're going to have to pay as a, as a starting matter. Uh, but then this free ad-supported version, well, that has problems too, doesn't it? They haven't told you anything about how or when those ads are going to appear, and they certainly haven't told you what is actually the case, that the ads appear in near full-screen pop-ups that they track most everything you do online. Yes. It does. And you know, the company that makes this would take that position to their deathbed. They'd say, this isn't spyware because you agree to install it. Of course, if you agree to install it without being told what it's going to do, then it, it certainly seems deceitful, doesn't it? Underhanded at the very best, in that if they don't tell you they're going to track what you're doing, and then they do perform exactly that kind of tracking, you can't help but In fact, feel they, they've, duped. they've sent letters to people saying because the, uh, they have come to a settlement agreement with the FTC, therefore they're not spyware. Indeed, they send out letters saying they're FTC certified. I have just such a letter in my inbox. Uh, that, of course, is a mistake. They shouldn't go around saying they're FTC certified, but sometimes they do anyway. Uh, so that's, that's Zango in terms of their installation practices, not quite doing what the settlement seems to require. Maybe Eileen's staff will get to sue them again, which I would say is a privilege and an honor rather than a, a duty, but I don't know if they'll think of it that way. Uh, separately, the settlement also obliges Zango to label ads. And here, too, the requirements are awfully precise, and I think they're, they're appropriate. They're exactly on target. Every ad needs to have a clear and prominent label saying what software showed the ad, identify it, and then provide a hyperlink that gives instructions as to how to remove the software and how to complain if you don't like it. So pretty clear, right on the ad there needs to be that identification and a hyperlink. If you ever find a Zango ad that doesn't have the identification and or doesn't have the hyperlink, then you know they're in trouble. So what about it? Can you find such an ad? Well, yes, of course you can find such ads. For example, 
they insert this toolbar into Internet Explorer, and lo and behold, it has ads. Each of these buttons is an offer from a bona fide third party. They get paid for taking you through to the third party site, be it career builder or some mortgage service provider or what have you. And there is no labeling. You look on screen for anything telling you what software showed this ad, and you can't find it. You look on screen for the hyperlink about how to uninstall or how to complain, and again, you can't find it. Open and shut, it seems to me. Here, too, they put icons onto your desktop. These are ads for third-party software, actually, for software online. That's the name of the company. They got in trouble with the Washington State Attorney General for telling users that their computers were infected with spyware when they weren't. Uh, these are ads. You know, they're desktop icons promoting third parties for a fee, and yet they don't have the kind of labeling that the settlement requires. So I, you know, I think these are pretty straightforward in terms of violations, and I'm looking forward to the FTC doing something about it. Um, if not, we'll tar and feather them in the press, and that would be okay too. But elsewhere in the spyware, spyware ecosystem, so to speak, that is beyond Zango, there are other interesting practices still ongoing, um, perhaps not as, as top line in terms of the prominence and folks noticing. Here's an ad that got syndicated to a website I was visiting, syndicated through a top ad network. My notes don't say which right here. It says, if your computer has been running slower than usual, it may be infected with adware or spyware to scan, click yes below. Well, there are several things about this that are underhanded. For example, warning spyware notice in the top left corner. They haven't conducted any scan to tell you that you're infected with any spyware. Here, when you have the no button and the X button, those are negative buttons that maybe shouldn't do anything or should take away this ad. In fact, they'll take you through to the ad landing page trying to get you to install their software, which will tell you you're infected even if you're not, and then charge you to disinfect. And this is all fascinating because it comes from a company called Kasali Media, a top 10 ad network with offices all over the place and real money uh, in the bank such that you could sue them and take their money, uh, which might not be a bad idea on these facts. Separately, I continue to test some spyware that has just remarkably uh, tenacious effects, remarkably invasive, and reaching right into Google, for example, and putting an ad where, of course, we all know no ad belongs. So here's an ad for Singular, a company that earlier this year settled litigation with the New York Attorney General's office as to their improper spyware delivered advertising. Well, here, inserted right into the Google site without Google's permission, obviously, is an ad promoting Singular. And you see the same kinds of ads promoting HP, Verizon. I've got dozens of these examples. Most every big U.S. banner advertiser gets infected this way. Sometimes you even see a Google AdSense frame inserted into the top of the Google homepage in a particularly ironic twist. Um, who do you blame for this? Well, you certainly could blame full context, if only you could find them. I, despite some efforts, couldn't figure out where they're located. You could also blame the ad networks that are trafficking in this sort of placement. They're paying full context in order to show the ads, and that certainly is what sets the practice in motion. Finally, the advertisers perhaps could do more to get to the bottom of this. Well, let me, yes? The New York Attorney General's office filed, uh, well, was conducting an investigation that ultimately settled, and there were three companies that were at issue, Singular, Priceline, and Ari, do you have the third one on the tip of your tongue? Was it Verizon, or was it, it another phone was company? Um, we'll we'll think it? of it. In any event, these yeah. companies Travel were each spending on the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars per year with direct revenue, a notorious company that would install through exploits, make uninstall remarkably difficult, disguise their product as a printer driver so that it would automatically load every time you turned on your computer. And they were making these purchases directly from direct revenue, even after, you know, if you just typed the company's name into Google, you would readily find out that this company was up to no good. But they were doing it anyway. You'd go to the Sprint site and you'd get this big singular pop-up covering it. So the New York Attorney General's case stands for the much narrower proposition that if you do business to the tune of a large amount of money with a company whose bad practices have been so detailedly documented, then you can get sued. Whether you could be sued for a relationship and face liability for a relationship that was smaller, that was intermediated through several ad networks that would have been harder to track down, you know, that's still an open question, maybe, but it certainly seems less obvious. 
let me just make a, a quick commercial here, which is that at the uh, on the CDT.org website, we have a list of uh, spyware enforcement cases, and it lists the AG cases that the AG has brought, and including these, and the AGs have brought in the all the FTC cases and uh, the DOJ cases. Well, let me close with an example that's a little bit more complicated, but here we are at DEF CON, so I think everyone will probably enjoy that rather than complain about it. Uh, I was on a computer that had Zango software installed. You can see the Zango branding on this ad. This ad at least was properly labeled, and there it is saying that the ad came from Zango. I went to the Netflix website, and I got a pop-up, which you see here in the, in the top right corner, of Netflix. And you might say to yourself, gee, that's a strange way for Netflix to advertise. Advertise to people who are already at their site? I mean, why bother? If the user is already at Netflix, surely he's about to sign up for Netflix. In any event, there's nothing you can do to push him further into Netflix once he's there already. And that's actually the right response. Netflix would not want to buy this advertising. This advertising is a bad deal for Netflix, but a good deal for Zango and some of Zango's partners. They're getting paid on what's called a CPA basis, cost per acquisition. They get paid something like $40 for delivering a new user to Netflix. Now, where can you get a new user who really wants to sign up for Netflix? How about a user who's about to sign up for Netflix at Netflix.com? That's a good place to get a user who wants to sign up for Netflix. The guys who are at Blockbuster might prefer Blockbuster. The guys who are searching for car repair at Google probably don't want to sign up for Netflix. But the people who are about to sign up for Netflix, those are people who are really interested in Netflix. So convince those folks to sign up through this second window, the smaller one rather than the big one, and then you get $40 if you're Zango or Zango's partner. And it turns out that because the two browsers share a single set of cookies, even if the user signs up through the larger window, the background window, the partner will still get paid because the tracking pixel will still, will still kick and then the CPA tracking system will think that the partner deserves the commission. Well, in terms of how this happens, we can use a packet sniffer to see the underlying redirects. Straightforward enough, Zango software underlined in red there sees that I'm at Netflix, instructs the Zango software to load an ad from roundads.com. My browser begins to load that ad from roundads and is redirected to Linkshare. That's a US-based New York uh, affiliate network acquired by Rakuten last year for upwards of $400 million. So they're doing pretty well. Uh, and then Linkshare redirects me onwards to Netflix. So what happened? Zango saw that I was at Netflix. Zango sends me to Round Ads. Round Ads sends me to Linkshare. Linkshare sends me back to Netflix. And all of a sudden, Netflix is out $40 if the user makes a sign up. This is still Zango's business. They're doing this all over the place. I have automation that catches dozens of examples per week, send them off to my advertiser and ad network clients even to try to get to the bottom of this mess. Nothing in the FTC settlement prohibits Zango from cheating advertisers. That's just not what the FTC was going after. Uh, and Zango really seems to be retrenching in this kind of business model, even as they face pressure on other fronts. Are you? Thanks, Ben. Um, well, that gives a lot for us to talk about in the Q&A portion of coming. Uh, but next we have Mario Vuxon from Bit9. Uh, and Mario is going to talk uh, about uh, the, impo up, the, the increasingly important issue of code signing and how uh, it relates to uh, th this issue. Thank you, Ari. So we'll try to put a finger on you know, roughly what is the size you know, of, the, of the problem or you know, how serious it is. So uh, my name is Mario Vux and I'm a director of knowledge based services at uh, uh, Bit9. And uh, for you who don't know, Bit9 is a leading uh, application control and device control uh, vendor. We also have a Bit9 knowledge base, which is the world's largest uh, database of information, files, and applications. And uh, with that, I would like to uh, talk about uh, malicious use of certificates. And uh, I'll first you know, lead you through simply a process for obtaining a certificate, illustrate to you a problem, although you've seen a fair amount of slides, you know, uh, from from Ben on this on this topic, and then we're going to look into uh, the issues of you know uh, how certificates get uh, revoked and uh, what is the current status of of uh, certificates being used for uh, malicious signing. So let's say you obtain a certificate from a certificate authority. Uh, it's quite simple to sign your code. Uh, you obtain an authentic code toolset from Microsoft uh, to sign your CABs. EXEs and OCXs uh, that will uh, 
trigger that uh, window in uh, in browsers uh, validating a certificate and telling users hopefully what is the valid uh, uh, publisher of the certificate and uh, what is the product that uh, this vendor is trying to sell you. In the same regard, you could be signing Netscape, Java, Apple, or VBA VBA components. Same mechanism works. Uh, so. What a certificate would do for uh, potential ISVs is would that is that it would uh, attest to the code's integrity and it would uh, help a user determine the code's provenance, meaning you know it will see the company's name and it will know uh, who has published a particular code. And then on the other hand, the uh, software that's doing the validation uh, will uh, most likely check the certificate certificate revocation list, and if the uh, certificate is not disabled, uh, you'll be able to proceed. Or, you know, if the certificate is uh, on a on an, uh, uh, revoked list, like these two Microsoft certificates that uh, you know that had an issue uh, several years back, uh, you, you you would get uh, warned appropriately. Typically, uh, certificates are used only to sign the installers. People don't sign uh, every single file in their install. I mean, there's a significant binary overhead. And uh, yes, it would be very nice if every file you know, had some kind of a signature so we could uh, easily uh, check through the entire machine and, and figure out you know, what came from which source. Problems, I'm, I'm really sorry about the small uh, nature of the images, you know, real problems uh, with certificates are well known. I mean, Ben Edelman did a great piece two years ago that uh, questioned uh, the viability of, uh, of a certificate issued to an entity called Click Yes to Continue. Uh, definitely not a valid company name, definitely nothing you could ever Google and then come up with uh, anything meaningful. But nevertheless, a certificate issued to this entity that then uh, uh, used that certificate to uh, sign equally meaningless uh, piece of code that uh, was clearly uh, geared towards uh, uh, urging the user to install uh, unwanted pieces of software. Well, today the names of these publishers have changed. You'll see that the uh, package names pretty much have more or less the same uh, uh, text as uh, Ben showed yesterday, I mean yesterday earlier, or uh, as they're shown here. When it comes to certificate authorities that issue certificates to software companies, the uh, market is uh, mainly dominated by two companies. We all know that, very Sun and Totti. There are some newcomers like Komodo. And uh, in reality, any CEA uh, that's mentioned in the Trusted the Root Certification Authority section in your Explorer uh, could be issuing certificates for code signing. There are minor differentiators between these vendors, mainly in price and also how long they have been uh, uh, listed in the Trusted Root Certification uh, Authorities section, which will just sort of mean, mean uh, what's your backward compatibility if you were to use their uh, certificate. The big problem with uh, uh, code signing certificates for authorities is that it's not really a revenue leader in any shape or form. I mean, even though they're expensive, roughly ranging around $600 uh, a year uh, for a code signing certificate, there's very few companies, you know, number-wise, who use them, and so and, and so they feature minorly in the overall revenue scheme, and definitely do not urge these companies to heavily invest into verifying and uh, uh, tracking uh, certificates after issuance. Also, uh, certificate authorities are responsible to provide for a revocation list. They just maintain the revocation list, but they leave the responsibility for the usage of the revocation lists back to the software developers. So the uh, software developer will really have to go through every single uh, certificate authority, get their revoca revocation lists, bundle it together, and validate each time uh, the new certificate uh, is uh, being seen. Well. Uh, so it becomes quite interesting to figure out, so how do I get a, uh, a certificate from either of these two organizations? Very simply, you go to the website. I'm not sure if you, you know, see very much details. There's not really nothing spectacular here. It's just a general uh, e-commerce form. Uh, enter your technical uh, company or uh, business contact information in it. And uh, uh, finally, please uh, give us uh, your uh, charging information so we could uh, 
proceed to complete this uh, transaction by charging you money and then potentially calling you in a couple of days to validate whether the telephone number that you've issued is correct and whether it belongs to the entity that you have specified in the certificate. That's all. Tati sort of does things a bit different. Uh, it tells you that you need to uh, certify your business uh, status, your, your uh, business type. After you uh, decide on what type of certificate you're trying to get and fill out your personal information, you will be asked to, um, to classify their business type. And so one of the interesting options here is that you could select to be doing business as or trading as, so meaning uh, to declare yourself to be of a status that has no relevant uh, paper trail that you need to submit back to Toti. And that's it. So you, you, know, you get your uh, user agreement, which are quite interesting in terms of the you know, liability and then powers that it gives to the certificate authorities. Uh, so after you see that, ignore that, you know, you're on, on your own. So after you obtain your certificate, uh, there's really not much threat to a particular uh, spyware vendor uh, of any sort. Uh, based on um, Ben's uh, piece of two years ago, Verisign actually put in a, a, a complaint page for you know report report code uh, uh, signing and misuse. This is here, in. and uh, that's nothing that Thoughty or Commodore have yet implemented. So in their world, uh, certificates are usually revoked by vendors asking themselves uh, to have their own certificate revoked in case there was an infringement of any sort. But it's very difficult for public to submit a request you know, for whatever the uh, user agreement violation there was, you know, that uh, the company would then take an action and do something about it. In case a uh, certificate made it to a certificate revocation list, uh, it would take about 24 hours before that would actually get published and start uh, getting picked up by uh, uh, browsers. And then, uh, as a final comment, it turns out that only ten, about 10 class 3 certificates are being revoked monthly. So that's just a very small number, you know, in terms of the, uh, when compared to the Spiver universe out there. So, um, User agreements also have not changed very much you know, in the last two years. So I'm just you know, quoting here from uh, you know from from uh, uh, Ben's blog, very interesting piece you know for for anyone uh, to check out, where uh, all three uh, vendors more or less you know state that you know to distribute malicious or harmful content of any kind uh, by the software that you certified uh, is a violation of the agreement, and then also it gives the power to the certificate authority to go and do something about. So having seen that, uh, we looked in our Bit9 knowledge base to try to figure out the top 10 offenders. And so let me just you know, do some background on you know, how we came up with this list. It's really based on uh, one million unique uh, uh, malicious samples that we have uh, acquired. We don't really track malware. We really after getting the information on the known good software. But you know, in the process, uh, Spyware uh, gets through, and we're using multiple uh, anti-malware scanners to, to, to detect and appropriate label this software. So uh, we have uh, found this uh, uh, found uh, product signed by uh, uh, these entities here that uh, had to be detected by more than three different scanners you know, to make it to the list. And uh, once the report was done, we found 177 total publishers of this type. You know, with, uh, as you can see on this list, you know, Cougar Technologies uh, leading with about you know, 1,700 apps signed. And uh, many of these uh, companies are not really all that uh, prominent, uh, except for obviously Zango and Wenyu, which are you know, towards the bottom of the list, meaning they're still very much active and they're using uh, all the artifacts of uh, uh, available there to make themselves uh, um, look uh, uh, benign, appropriate, you know, friendly to the end user, to really you know, use anything that we have devised to assure the, uh, the general consumer of the good nature of the software being distributed. Uh, okay, so just quickly go through these uh, uh, three samples. Uh, Cougar Technologies is a, a company based out of uh, uh, Netherlands and uh, signs pretty much you know, two different uh, p uh, pieces of software. One is, one, one is called Sexy Sexy and the one is called, uh, almost like in previous example, you know, uh, Click on Yes. 
and Sexy Sexy has been in the last two, two years uh, uh, published in 1,700 variants, which, you know, if you divide it, you know, in sort of, you know, in the, in the daily build uh, sense, it would be probably about three years worth of daily builds. So this is extremely prolific company for which you will never find the website uh, or any relevant Google results. So they usually come up, you know, uh, by various dialers, you know, uh, labels. And uh, here I have some uh, file details on actually the package that was signed. Uh, a second example, Plugin Movie Limited, is a well doc documented uh, certificate uh, which has been, uh, there's a nice write up on the uh, Sunbelt Software's uh, research center. It's a high risk porn dialer uh, coming uh, out of a company that registered itself in London. Again, package name is really, really, you know, uh, non-informative of what you're trying to install and it's well known uh, uh, if using a number of uh, anti-malware scanners. Fast Track uh, is a company out of uh, Poland, does porn dialers, uh, and again, you know, a couple of packages that do, NetVision and Fast Track, uh, have the same problems that we've seen all along. So the questions to consider in the future is, you know, whether this system is inherently broken, whether it could fix itself, and uh, to really try to figure out, you know, is any of the technology uh, updates that are coming uh, going to address uh, issues? Or what I would suggest, you know, if you are ready to uh, look into alternative solutions and potentially uh, start working towards a global software registry. Great, thanks, Maria. Um, the, so look, well, I want to take one question, and then you can so that people can get a taste of what the Q and A will be like, since uh, I, I, I think uh, um, getting in more detail would probably be really interesting. Um, so why don't we take one question here, and then people can decide whether they want to move with us to the Q and A or not. Anyone have a question? Follow up with anyone here? Yes. Is there anything that the bad guys cannot take advantage of to make themselves look like good guys? Mario and Ben, you want to answer that first and then Eileen give Eileen. To answer. I think Eileen's, no, Eileen's thinking. <laughs> I mean, this is, uh, I'll, I'll start with an answer since no one's jumping at it. I mean, it's a very good question. I mean, we have, you have the same problem in pretty much every cyber fraud area, in spam, in phishing, right? The more that you go about, uh, to try and uh, at build protections, the uh, the more that the uh, the fraudsters take advantage of um, the, the the those uh, of what that looks like. Um, we've seen that uh, it, even in some of the more complex areas in phishing, where they've tried to come up with new schemes. Uh, and I've heard some researchers say, in in the phishing case. Well, maybe we shouldn't do as much user education. Maybe we'd be better off with the fishers being dumb, and then we can block for for users rather than, uh, to, you know, trying to have them subvert uh, subvert that system. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know how other people feel about that, but I think that uh, eventually, by making it harder and, and making the the cost of development more expensive, um, then uh, they have to be able to recoup that, and that becomes harder. So that's really the only uh, outgoing. Uh, defense that I can see is just, you know, in terms of an all-out war, uh, making it so expensive that the, the bad, that it's too expensive for the for the bad guys. The right, but uh, they make they make millions of dollars, but. I mean, if you look at the ad, so you look at the adware companies, they have to deal with the FTC, they have to deal with, uh, uh, well, I mean, it, it, and internationally, then they ha they, if they have partners, I mean, that's the one really good thing from the, that we've, that we've seen from those AG cases that were mentioned, that, that Ben raised, was, you know, even if you advertise, you're a U.S. company that advertises, so a U.S. company that advertises is a Canadian company that's a network, you know, uh, if you're, if the, the way that the ad systems work, and, and that's the one thing about spyware, is the adware side of it, at least, has been very advertising based. A lot of the advertising points are based in North America. They're the key advertising points for people to really make money. So if you can get at that piece of it and make it more expensive in that front, um, then, you can do that, then you can start to at least make it harder for people to do business in that space, the bad guys. Thank you.
outside of either. Sure. You know, I think anti-spyware companies generally have been pretty hard to, to attack here. When, you know, when Zango threatens to sue Symantec, Symantec doesn't mind that much. Come and get us. Here's the address for service of process. We look forward to seeing you in court. New.net, uh, you know, pretty big spyware type company installing without consent, did sue Lavasoft, a German anti-spyware company, in federal court and lost. They lost twice, actually. First the judge dismissed half their case and then he dismissed the other half and was quite fed up with New.net by the end of it. It has not been an easy attack for spyware companies against security companies. And so the first line of defense for most users is their anti-spyware software, which will detect most stuff most of the time. Uh, in terms of peer review, I was on the board of advisors of a company called Site Advisor, which started off by having automated systems that would browse the web, download every EXE they could find, scan for spyware, see if there was any, anything bad about that EXE, but then supplement it by asking users to submit reviews. You can do it right now. If you think of a bad site that you think Site Advisor might be rating green, just go to SiteAdvisor.com, look up the site. If it comes out green, register, create an account, and say why it's bad. And the site probably will switch over to yellow or red according to the gravity of what you propose. So, you know, it works. There are some millions of users using it. On the other hand, most users have never heard of it. And so it's only the beginning to really getting to the problem, bottom of the problem. Well, we have to get going, but let's move the discussion to the Q&A session, uh, Q&A room. I hope that uh, the people that have questions will follow us up there. Thanks.